Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Hub Day edition of the Yard. Yeah, we're getting an early start. How about that? Yeah, a lot to talk about. I don't think the Bulldogs could have had a better draft, honestly. I uh, spoke to Chris Simonis last night. You can read uh, his comments about Mississippi State's draft only at jeanspage.com, available for our VIP subscribers. Go by if you're not a member. It's a good reason to join. Get uh, one-on-one comments directly from your head baseball coach about the draft and about some other things, too. And uh, we're going to address some of those things today on the show because here's the deal. As we started this whole uh, offseason – And unfortunately, it was an elongated offseason again for us, which does not bode well for any of us. We don't like it at all. We like to be uh, in contention for things when it comes to college baseball. But there were three major hurdles we had to clear. The first was getting a pitching coach. And not just any pitching coach. We needed to get an elite pitching coach. Well, check that off the box as you've got Justin Parker from South Carolina one of the best pitching coaches in the country. Then you needed to be able to navigate the draft without having your signing class decimated. We've done that. We lost two players, and both of those we expected to lose. One, Aiden Smith, of course, we – there was some, some, you know, some ebb and flow with all of that. But uh, down the stretch, it's not a big surprise for us, even though I do think that he uh, he will have a good professional career. And we needed to, uh, you know, get some pieces back on the current roster. There were six players that we thought may be drafted, only three of them were. So we're gonna break all that down today and uh, we're gonna feel good about the direction of things because now that we understand who's been drafted and we do expect everybody that was drafted to sign. So now you know what you have, you can begin to kind of work through roster management and then focus your full energy on the portal. And then we're going to put a team on the field this fall and begin figuring out who can help us and who can't. And we're going to get back into the NCAA tournament next year and go make some racket. That's what we're going to do. And again, three huge things we need to take care of. Two of them we have handled beautifully. Now we have to get into this portal and we've got to go get some uh, some big arms to help close out this portal class uh, to put us in a position that we can really be Uh, a really good ball club next year. Uh, If you hadn't done so too, let me encourage you, go to uh, the new website, whenthebottomfalls.com. That's where you can find my newest book. You can find all my books there, as a matter of fact, uh, with with rare exception. But uh, go to to whenthebottomfalls.com. I wrote a book about uh, my path to recovery and kind of life's lessons learned in 30 plus years of recovery from alcoholism and substance abuse. It's a very transparent book. There are a lot of things I put in there that many of you don't know. Matter of fact, I have, I've had my mom uh, message me a couple times. She said, I'm probably going to cry the whole way through this. And that's one of the reasons that I was reluctant to write this book in the first place. To be quite honest with you, is there are some people who love me that are going to see some things that, that uh, maybe perhaps that they didn't know. And even though I've been sober now 31 plus years, I'm still her son. And so she's going to see some things that, um, you know, they're going to be uncomfortable for her. But I felt that I had to write this book for the still suffering addict and alcoholic and those who love them. This is not a vanity project by any stretch of the imagination. I'm trying to help other people. So if you know someone that's struggling with alcoholism and or chemical dependency, I would encourage you to buy this book for them. If you know a person that's in recovery that perhaps could Use some encouragement. I encourage you to buy this book. And maybe if you just want to know a good story, if you want to know a good comeback story, maybe buy it for yourself. But again, that's whenthebottomfalls.com, and you can uh, pre-order it now. It will be released sometime in September. As we get closer, I'll give you uh, the release date. But uh, while you're there, of course, you can get copies of uh, Dogpile, Flim Flam, and Alpha Dogs. And again, they told me they found uh, a handful of copies of Start Villain. So if you missed out on that, you can pick that up too. But uh, I'm very excited about it. Uh, I'm a little nervous about it, to be quite honest with you. I mean, I'm, I'm confident in who I am and the life that I've led. 
But uh, I think some people are going to see me in a different light. I really do. I think there are some people are going to say, you know what? I didn't know that he was capable of all this, but I am. And so there's some things that'll, that are shared in the book that uh, maybe you don't know. But it is what it is. I put it out there. I mean, not everything's for public consumption, but uh, it's, it's probably the most candid and transparent I can be without hurting other people, right? That's, part, that's one of the things we talk about in, uh, in AA is step number 10, continue to take personal inventory. And uh, I guess I was, excuse me, step nine. <laughs> it, yeah, 31 years, right? At step nine, we talk about make amends, except when to do so would injure them or others. You know, others could mean me, but uh, nevertheless, I do know the 12 steps. I, I memorized them like the first couple of days of treatment, thinking I, I could impress them with how smart I was, and maybe they just let me leave. Didn't work out. Didn't work out. And I'll tell you this, too, you know, before we move on to the draft. AA is about the only thing in life I haven't been able to kind of sham. You know, sometimes you just get through life being, being a little bit smarter than everybody else, a little bit more motivated than everybody else. But when it came to recovery and working 12 steps, it is the only thing that I've not been able to BS in my life. Hadn't been able to just talk my way through it. Hadn't been able to just go out there and give a half-hearted effort. I had to really do the deal. And, and uh, I had a discussion recently online with somebody about this. You know, we can't get out here and play AA. You know, the big book tells us that half measures avail us nothing. And that's one of the things, whether it be uh, recovery or life or work or whatever, you know, it's practicing these principles in all our affairs. Half measures avail us nothing. Either be all in or all out. And so if you want to get out there and play AA, and then you can say, well, I tried it. It didn't work for me. No, you didn't work for it. It's a difference. And, and what, what is more valuable than our own lives? It's impossible to save somebody without fear. People that do not fear their own lives, fear losing their own lives, there, there's no way to save those people. You have to make people understand there's value in living. And I was one of those people I, I didn't want to live. I didn't. It wasn't that I was scared to die, I was scared to live. Much different dynamic. But anyway, I'm not going to spend the whole show talking about that. So more about that again at whenthebottomfalls.com. Be sure and check that out. All right, let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company. I love Bulldog Burger Company. I do. And, uh, again, I still got that hankering for those uh, sweet heat chicken sliders. I think I may go ahead and remedy that today. I'm excited about that. I really am. Uh, you get the Hawaiian roll, and then you get that nice, well-seasoned piece of chicken on there. And uh, it's an interesting contrast. It is. That's one of the things I love about Bulldog Burger Company is a lot of things you can get there you can't get anywhere else. They're very unique to Bulldog Burger Company. I know what I'm going to get when I go there. No matter what I order on the menu, I know that I'm going to get a quality product at a quality price with quality service. You can't say that about a lot of places. You just can't. And there's three great locations to serve you. University Drive here in Star Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, Lake Harbor Drive in a rich and flowwood area. Got some live music from time to time over in Tupelo. Have tap takeovers really at all three locations. Always something new and fresh, whether it be something on the menu or perhaps a new activity at Bulldog Burger Company, the best place to go. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet, M-E-A-T. All right, let's start with who got drafted from the current roster. Now, no big surprise, we talked about this uh, on Monday. Colton Ledbetter, the second-round pick of the Tampa Bay Rays, mm -hmm. number 55 overall. You know, the talk about Colton Ledbetter the second half of the season is that he is one of the top 50 prospects in this draft. He acts up ended up being ranked 49th and drafted at 55. So pretty close to the projection there. His slot value is $1.51 million. Now, people say, Steve, what is slot value? A lot of people, like, sometimes we're scared to ask those questions on message boards and social media because even though we want to know, we don't want to come off as uh, being a casual fan, right? Sometimes we're like, Steve, I just want to know. I'm, I don't want people to shout me down and say, what are you, idiot? No. So here's what slot value is. So when they put the collective bargaining agreement together several years ago, they tried to assign a value to each pick in the first half of the draft. They've kind of modified it a little bit. 
And so basically what the pick value or the slot value lets them know is this is the approximate signing bonus. Now, there are some creative clubs out there, as you saw with Jake Mangum several years ago, several years ago, a few years ago. Jake came back to school and was drafted much higher but didn't command a huge signing bonus because he didn't have any leverage. So then the Mets were able to pay him less than slot value and then bank the rest of that because each team has a bonus pool with which to sign players with. And so if you're able to save money on Jake Mangum in whatever it was, the the sixth round or eighth round, whatever, I can't remember, but um, then you can use that money to incentivize a high school player to come on and go play pro ball rather than go to college. So – that's basically what it means. The slot value basically is an estimate of what the approximate signing bonus would be. Sometimes teams pay over slot, but many times teams pay under slot. So Colton Ledbetter, I don't know what kind of agent he has, but he had the full year of leverage, obviously, because he could come back to school and get nothing next year. That's how that people are like, well, Steve, they got to come back and improve their draft stock for next year and get nothing from a signing bonus standpoint. And that signing bonus is what sustains them, right? So, you, you know, you get the big signing bonus because you're not going to get paid much at all in the minors. And, uh, you know, you can take care of your parents. You can pay off your student loans. You can um, you know, buy yourself a car, maybe a house, uh, depending on how lucrative your signing bonus is. But Colton Ledbetter is going to be a millionaire very, very soon. Very, very soon. All right. So we get into uh, day two, and that was the big day, right? We've talked about when guys are drafted in the first ten rounds, just about always sign, with rare exception. Cade Smith goes in the sixth round to the New York Yankees with the 192nd pick in the draft. You know, there was some discussion. You know, Cade didn't have a great combine, and people wondered, well, you know, will he drop out of the top ten? And maybe he comes back to school with a little NIL money in his pocket. Cade's going to sign. And good for Cade. Gets with a great organization. Slot value for him is 285000 So, you know, he'll, ha- he'll get a couple hundred thousand dollars or so and be able to kind of get a head start at life. And I had uh, a national cross checker tell me, Cade Smith is going in the top ten rounds. And he did. And good for Cade. Kellum Clark, a guy that I know wanted to sign. I'm a huge Kellum Clark fan. Uh, love Kellum, love his family. Appreciate all his contributions to Mississippi State. Uh, at times had a really good year, really changed his scout a little bit last year, learned to kind of take that ball the other way. A lot of people were pitching him away with that slider, uh, the breaking ball. He learned to take it the other way. Really surprised he didn't go before the 20th round. The analytics, of course, strikeout rate are kind of working against him. But uh, he, even though it's 20th round, there is no slot value after the first 10 rounds. Uh, so he will get a signing bonus that is really probably not comparable to what Cade will get, you know, maybe 100000 or so, maybe. You know, usually it's like 125000 or so. Um, but Kellum's going to sign. And so all three of your current – Diamond Dogs that were drafted, Ledbetter, Smith, and Clark, they will not return next year. That's important to understand. They're not. And we wish them the best. And, again, people are like, but, Steve, if Kellum's drafted in the 20th round, why wouldn't he come back? Well, here's the deal. Let's say, what if his signing bonus is 25000 which is not insignificant money by, you know, our, our lives, right? But when you think about, you know, the draft, when you got a guy that's going to get over a million – and you make it 25000 you say, well, it's, it's peanuts. Well, yeah, you know what's peanuts is when you come back as a senior and they give you 5000 because you have no leverage. You have no negotiating power. So, yeah, Kellum is going to sign. Kellum wants to sign and begin his pro career. And uh, we wish him the best. Again, I'm a huge fan, man, of Kellum Clark. And uh, appreciate his contributions and everybody's contributions to Bulldog Baseball. And, you know, Cade Smith and Kellum Clark were both – Part of our 2021 NAFL championship team. And, you know, we don't beat Virginia without Kellum Clark. Remember that, the winner's bracket game? Our first hit of the ball game was a big home run from Kellum Clark. And, of course, the coup de grace 
against Vanderbilt. Big shot from Kellum Clark. I got a lot of fond memories of Kellum Clark, as should you. So we wish them the best, and uh, we'll miss them. We will. We've got to move forward, though. Now, there were three other players that we thought may be drafted. Casey Hunt was one of them. You know, Casey was drafted last year, elected to come back to boost his stock, and again, had some injuries this year. I really thought the breaking ball was better this year than it's been at any point in his career. And I, I would be intrigued to see what Justin Parker could do with him because he didn't get drafted. And there's a lot of talk that he is going to entertain some free agent deals and likely sign a free agent deal. You know, my argument would be that free agent deal is going to be there next year too. You know, and of course, you got to work it all out with Lamonis and the staff and everything else. But, you know, I think, you know, KC at times we probably extended him too long. You know, I mean, I go back to the Auburn game. He was filthy, and we left him out there for a while just trying to navigate through the game when they had the big comeback there. And that's not really a criticism of KC. We're just trying to do what it takes to win a game and save an arm or two for the next day. But I like KC. I do. I think he's a, he, he's a piece. And how many times do we bring him in when he needed to get a ground ball and he's able to get under barrels? Like he's able to tunnel that breaking ball through the arm slot if it's fastball. And so – but Casey, I don't expect him back. It'd be a surprise at this point. Amani Larry was not drafted. And I'm going to pat myself a little bit on the back here for having pretty good sources. You know, in the beginning of this process, I told everybody there's a real possibility of Amani Larry doesn't even get drafted. And people wanted to argue me down. He's like, oh, well, the mocks say this and the mocks say that. I'm telling you what I have been told about Amani, and I love Amani Larry. I'm a fan. You know, he's very limited position-wise. Really good college player, not a really good prospect for the next level. Arm strength's a part of it. You know, he, he's a guy that doesn't have the arm to play the left side of the infield, and he's kind of limited to what he could do in the outfield. And so he's pretty much penciled in and kind of pigeonholed as a second baseman, unless he's going to DH for you a little bit. So, so he's not a good pro prospect, and uh, he'll be back. Now, that's not to say that he couldn't uh, – you know, play his way into some opportunities or maybe sign a free agent deal. But he is a really good college player. But he's just somewhat limited in what he can do. So we expect him back, which provides some depth in the middle infield, which is huge. And then there's Aaron Nixon. I know Aaron Nixon really wanted to sign. Aaron Nixon, again, had the bad 22, banged up in 23, and so now he's in a situation where he's got to come back and play another year of college baseball. And uh, it's, it's good for us. You know, selfishly, you say, hey, it's good for Mississippi State. And it is. But you also get caught up behind this whole thing, too. Is, you know, it's so easy to get caught up and say, you know, hey, what is best for us? And sometimes that may not be exactly what the young man wants. And I think Aaron Nixon truly wanted to sign and um, – is disappointed he didn't get that opportunity. And you see that happens. Usually, you know, bullpen guys, closers, they go much later in the draft. So there's, they don't fetch a high signing bonus. But Aaron's going to have an opportunity to come in here and um, improve himself. And, and hopefully he can be healthy the full year and show people what he can do and uh, maybe get an opportunity next year uh, to be drafted. So that's how it sits with uh, your current players. Now, the rest of the updates about your signing class is there is no update because there were no other players drafted. You know, last year we had to deal with, you know, Gerangelo Sanchi got drafted late, I think, 18th round by the Brewers. And the Brewers obviously didn't have a lot of bonus money left available. So we weren't especially worried about it. But here's the deal is what you worry about is kind of like what happened with the Orioles last year. You know, the kid from Wichita State elects not to sign. And then Carter Young, who had uh, announced a transfer to LSU, He's drafted late, and they come in and throw a million plus in front of that kid, and he goes, right? And so you're looking at Gerangelo, and you're thinking, you know, I think we're okay here, but it's a draft and follow type deal. You draft him to have the rights to negotiate with him, and then if some money comes available later, you can say, hey, I know slot value was 125000 or whatever, but – we didn't sign this other guy, so we've got, you know, a half a million dollars to give you now. That's kind of that whole process. We don't have anybody to sweat out this year because no other signees were drafted after Aiden Smith was drafted. It's huge, absolutely huge. 
we knew Colin Hawk was going to go. Colin Hoke, excuse me. We knew that. We knew he'd be a first rounder. Ends up being, a, you know, a comp round pick in between the first and second. Technically a first rounder, but you knew he was going to go. And and of course he's the uh, what first pick of the Mets. So you know they're going to cash in, right? So things worked out for him. But you know you can't miss what you never had. That's the situation. We haven't been expecting them. Aiden Smith's situation was a little bit different. We were hearing a month ago that he was going to come to school, and then things kind of shifted around a little bit. Um, so he's going to sign. And best of luck to him and his family, period. Mm-hmm. Outside of that, there's nothing to sweat out because you had a bunch of guys, including Dylan Kopp, that turned down big money in the last two days. Uh, you know, Makai Grant, you, know, you had some guys out there that got some calls from major league teams, you're like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to stay in school. And, again, you go back to the thing we talked about last week. All of your high school signees were on campus hanging out together, already taking summer school classes, already getting familiar with Starkville and the amenities afforded to them through Mississippi State baseball, except for two guys, Hawk and Smith. And so Colin Hawk – Aiden Smith elect to wait out the draft at home, and you know Aiden Smith's like, "Hey, you know, if I don't get, if I don't go on day one or day two, I'm I'm headed to Starkville." Well, I'm sure he was. I'm sure that's exactly what he planned to do. But you know, he is going to get paid over slot uh, for his you know pick by the Mariners. But it's done, and this is probably the last time we ever talk about him, right? I mean, they're no longer a part of our program. We wish them the best. There are no hard feelings. We're going to focus on who we have and what we have. There are a couple things that I think that, uh, you know, the guys, you know, Dylan Cop, you know, we talk about, well, Steve, who can help us next year? Well, you know, there's a handful of guys that can. You know, and again, you look at all of the, uh, you know, you look at all the pitchers that come in. Obviously, they'll have an opportunity. But, uh, you know, Dylan Cop is a guy we expect. We expect him to come in and really compete hard for that starting position at short. You know, and there's, of course, there's Marshawn, and you know, Larry's coming back, so you have some depth there, and you get Logan Kohler from Memphis to come in. You know, so now you got four guys for three spots. You know, somebody's got a DH, right? We'll figure all that out. But, uh, you know, some of these guys, a little bit, you know, names that you're somewhat familiar with. You know, Jason Norton is a guy from another short middle infielder from Auburn, Alabama. A lot of people are really high on him. I've had some people tell me he could be the sleeper in this class. Nolan Stevens uh, elected to take himself out of the draft. First baseman, left-handed pitcher from Franklin, California. That was big. We talked about Makai Grant already. Uh, Dane Burns out of Prosper, Texas. This is another left-handed pitcher that we think has a chance to do some things. K.K. Clark, Kellum Clark's younger brother, competitor in every aspect. Riley Byers, left-hander out of Gibbs, Tennessee. We expect some big things from him. Jackson Owens, a JUCO guy, he'll be in, do a good job for us. But I tell you the guy that uh, – talking to a couple of scouts, the one guy that a lot of people can consistently mentioned is a dude that could probably help us this year is left-handed pitcher Luke Dodson from uh, Mount Perrin Christian uh, High School there in Georgia. They said Luke Dodson's the guy that was getting uh, you know, second and third round type looks but wanting to come to school. This is a guy, too, that uh, he's an all-around baseball player. So we look forward to kind of seeing what he can do. But, yeah, yeah, when you're having to depend on freshmen, as we saw last year, uh, that's tough, especially in the SEC. But when you've got guys and go out there and eat up some innings for you in the midweek and possibly pitch you a little bit situationally on weekends, it kind of prepares them for the future. All of our junior college guys had some things to talk about, too. You know, it's never in. It never ends. And that's Okay. You know, we want to be on guys that major league teams want, right? You don't want draft day to be, you know, just sitting around. You get a bunch of dudes just waiting for the phone to ring. It never does. You, know, you want to be able to kind of fend through all this. But um, Cam Schulke, a right-handed pitcher out of the College of Central Florida, they tell me this is a guy that can come in and eat up some middle relief innings for us on weekends. You know, of course, we got to see how they handle the fall. It's a big jump from junior college to the pros. I mean, to the SEC, which is kind of the same thing. Thumb, thumb. 
But Schulke is an arm slot guy. He's a guy that has multiple arm slots, has a three to four pitch mix, kind of dependent on the situation. But this is a guy a lot of people are excited about. Gavin Black, one of our more recent commitments, is a guy obviously that, um, you know, he has uh, just become a PO this year, pitcher only. Upside is big. He was another guy that we were a little bit concerned about with the draft. And so now that we're through the draft, and we're going to talk about some portal stuff later in the show, but now that we're through the draft, there's a lot of guys out there that were hoping to get drafted that didn't get drafted. So now they're looking for somewhere to play. You know, maybe they have the opportunity to return to their previous school. Maybe they don't. Or maybe they're thinking, you know what, I didn't get drafted. I got one more year of this thing. I'm going to go in the portal, and I'm going to go find an opportunity to play somewhere big time if I can. And then maybe that gets me on the draft radar for next year, even though the signing bonus will be squat. I get a chance to experience one last year. Maybe I go to Mississippi State or LSU or Arkansas or South Carolina or someplace like that. You know, that's important to understand. There are a lot of guys out there looking for a great place to play. And so the portal closes tomorrow. So you're going to see some guys go in the portal late. You're going to see some guys now that the draft is over, guys that were just thinking, you know what, I'm just going to let things play out. Well, you're going to see a run here in the next couple of days. Now, does that mean that there's big name, big name players in there? It doesn't. There is one big name player in, in that we're going to talk about later in the show. But there will be some value in the portal that doesn't exist right now in the next 48 hours. Now, we're on some big-time arms, and, again, we're going to talk about that later in the show. But don't be surprised if, for those of you guys that follow Kendall Rogers, that there's going to be a lot of names go in there in the next 48 hours that you're going to be like, hey, that's interesting. You know, that's awfully interesting right there. So – be mindful of that as we get ready to move forward. But, again, we could not have had a better draft. Absolutely could not. Now, of course, I, I want what the kids want, right, especially our current dogs. You know, the high school kids, it's a little different because you don't have the same level of relationship with them, right? I mean, you know, it's like, hey, it's kind of like Roy Oswald, right? He never pitched here, but it kind of feels like he's a bulldog because he grew up a bulldog. You know, he just had, you know, had a chance to go play and do some big things. So we still claim some sense of kinship with him, but even though he never wore the uniform, right? Um, what's interesting, you know, to me is uh, guys like Aaron Nixon. You know, uh, they come here and things didn't quite go as well as they planned. Now he's here again. So what kind of player is he next year? You know, does he come out with a chip on his shoulder? Does he come out there thinking, hey, you know what? I got, apparently I've got something to prove, and he does. Let's just kind of call it for what it is. He's a super talented guy. However, he hadn't put together a solid season since the freshman year. And some of that's not his fault because he's been a little banged up. I love the guy. And I think that having that guy in our clubhouse is going to be huge. Again, a veteran guy now that uh, knows what college baseball is all about. And so my hope is he can stay healthy this year and go put some things together for us. But uh, we've got to go out and hit the portal and uh, we need it. We got to get an ace. And if we could find two weekend starters, we certainly would take them. Absolutely would. Because it, it, it gives everybody else a chance to move back a day or two. That's big. It's super big. And again, if we can work the portal and have a little luck, you know, I think right now, I think we're a good team now. I'm not saying based on last year's results. I'm talking about post-draft with Justin Parker on the staff and the fact that we've got this influx of talent coming in from this signing class and the portal guys you have already. I think right now we're a good team. We put together a strong portal class, we could be a great team. And that's not hyperbole. That's just the reality. of We're on some of the best college baseball players in the country. And you got to get a couple of them. At the very least, you got to get a couple could get as many as three I don't think it's going to go beyond that but uh, we have got to go get some guys especially on the mound that have a special quality about them that allow people to fear Mississippi State again I don't think anybody's scared of us right now I don't like being that team that people aren't scared of I mean you know it's like LSU I mean we went in and we, we take two out of three from them but let's be honest I got so much respect for LSU and like if we're up 10 runs in the ninth I'm still nervous I mean you know right? It, it means a lot. It does. 
But they're also a team that's capable of coming back. You know, it's like same thing with Arkansas or Vanderbilt. You know, it's like I know they're never going to quit. And last year we showed some of that same quality with us. But I like it when people are scared of us. And I love being able to go read the message board post. Oh, they're not so great. And, you know, in the back of their minds you're thinking, oh, my gosh, we're fixing to get swept. I want to be a program that people fear year in and year out. That when you see Mississippi State on a schedule, you go ahead and pencil one and lose a weekend. I want to get back to that. And to be quite honest with you, even though we've won the NFL championship in 2021, we didn't really have that mystique about us then either. And we knew that people knew, hey, we're going to bring a good effort. But I want us to have that, that aura about us that we once did. It's like, you know what, when you play Mississippi State, you're not just playing those nine guys on the field. You're playing the fans, you're playing the tradition and the ghosts of Bulldogs past. We've got to recapture that. We do. We have to recapture that. And now again, I want to thank everybody again. The attendance this year, considering the quality of play at times this year, was outstanding. So nobody can say that Bulldog fans are fan weather, fair weather. There are a lot of other schools that claim a lot about attendance, and it's all in, in the paperwork. Not with us. Not with us. And I'm proud to be a part of uh, this great fan base. All right, time for today's top 10 list. As always, brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. But C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R.com. And here's the deal. The mortgage business is a tough business. Nobody stays in it for 20-plus years by accident. And now's a tough time, too, right? There's a lot of competition out there. There's a lot that's happening right now with mortgage lending. And so you need a professional that can kind of help you navigate through this and say, Steve, the times are tough right now. And, and it's true. It's true. That's why you need Blair Chandler, a true professional in the mortgage lending business. Give him a call or text today at 601-500-2344, 601-500-2344. You know, people always say, well, you know, it's a great time to do this. It's not a good time to do that. Listen, you know, I don't know your situation. You know, maybe you're in dire straits. Maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you need to consolidate some debt. I don't know. Blair can help you through that. There's no point going to bed every night just wondering and worrying about, you know what, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. How am I going to meet all these bills? Maybe you've got some medical bills. Maybe something's happened in your life. And you need some way to kind of get your head above water. Reach out to Blair. But more importantly, if you're a person, too, that's never had the opportunity to have your own home, let me tell you, there's a lot of security in that. It, not having a dadgum landlord, oh, my gosh. I never want to go back to that. And you know, the little pop-in thing, they come by and they're always like, what are you doing? You know, no, nah, I'm not doing that. Not to mention, too, it's nice knowing that one day I'm going to be able to have something to pass down to my, my children. You know, in this big old house out in the country that uh, I don't know if any of them want to live here or not. Maybe they'll sell it. I don't know what they'll do. But it'll be their decision because I've been able to, I'll be able to give that to them. That's an amazing thing to think about. And so I encourage you, call Blair, visit him at closeofblair.com or call him at 601-500-2344 and tell him about your own needs. Tell him about your dreams. Let's see if he can make them become a reality. All right, I know that Blair will probably need to uh, have one earbud in with this list today because he is a little delicate flower. You know, he is one of the Dave Matthews band people. You know, I'm just I'm just calling it for what it is, Blair. I love you, man, but I'm just telling you, you know, Blair. Blair I mean, you see Blair. Blair is a big physical guy, man. You you look at him and think, you know, what? Well, he's probably a Division One football prospect, but he, he's not. He's a Dave Matthews guy. I'm just telling you, it's true. So Blair, go ahead and turn the volume down when you put on the playlist today. We're going Stone Sour now. I could have gone Slipknot, and I may do that on Friday. I'm a Corey Taylor fan. So Stone Sour has some stuff that, you know, you Green Day fans might be able to listen to. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Because there's like some real substance in this music. We're going Stone Sour today on the top ten. And maybe we do Slipknot Friday. Maybe. Slipknot fans, let me hear from you if you want some more Corey Taylor on Friday. 
I like Stone Sour a lot. They're a different, I guess it's kind of like the way to describe it is a much different project from, uh, from Slipknot, but it's Corey Taylor is an ultra talented guy. He's also a guy that's in recovery. He's a brilliant songwriter. Uh, I like the solo album too, to be honest with you. I think it's interesting. We did a song with Tech Nine, some other people. Um, I like Corey Taylor, and I didn't initially, to be honest with you. I thought Corey Taylor was obnoxious, and I got to know more of his story. I was like, you know, maybe this guy isn't so bad. And then the music got better, too. But uh, I like Stone Sour, and so I'm going to give you my top ten Stone Sour tracks. Uh, we're going to go with Fabulous, number ten, and it's, uh, it's kind of a play on the word. It's, not, it's, it's Fabulous, not Fabulous, Fabulous. And uh, it's really kind of a song about access and, you know, all that stuff that goes along with all of that stuff. Uh, number nine is a great track. It's kind of a love song, and uh, it comes off a little bit poppy, to be quite honest with you. It's kind of in the vein of the old 80s hair, hair band ballad, you know, the power ballad. It's kind of in that same vein, but not exactly, right? It's like it's... It, you, you'll hear it whenever you hear the song you know what I'm talking about. It's got a modern feel to it, but it, you can tell it was a song that uh, was kind of written with that in mind. It's a song called Hesitate. I, I, I dig the song, man. Lyrically, the content is incredible, as it typically is uh, with Corey Taylor. But number eight, Hesitate, on your Stone Sour list. Number eight is song number three. Ironically, it's the third song on our list, but it's number eight. Song number three, and this, again, is kind of, Corey couldn't figure out a title, which is interesting. I think he did it to be a little bit pretentious here. Another great track. Number seven, the song is Tired. It's amazing to me when I look at the Spotify stuff that uh, how often these songs get streamed. And Tired is one of those that you look up and say, I guess everybody can can identify with this because we're all kind of fueled by energy drinks and, uh, and coffee. We don't get enough rest. Tired's a good track. Number six, this is going back several years here. It's Say You'll Haunt Me, and it's this is a rocking song, man. This is one of those, kind of like Fabulous, it, you, you think with a little more percussion and a little more amplification, it could have been a Slipknot song. But it's not. It's Stone Sour. Say You'll Haunt Me also has this uh, kind of a growling vocal at the end. Number five, it's Do Me a Favor. I like this one a lot. I like the sing-song instrumentation on this. It's like there's this little bounce back and forth in this song, and, and if you're familiar with it, you know what I'm talking about. It's like lyrically, the song really matches the composition. You know, sometimes you listen to stuff and it feels a little bit contrived, not Do Me a Favor. I mean, it, it just absolutely, it's like the song was written, like the lyrics weren't just written around the song. It's like they just kind of came together in this incredible fusion of sound, and it all just meshes up perfectly. So do me a favor, number five. Number four, this is a very emotional song, and uh, it's a song that a lot of people have identified with. And uh, again, there's this hammer-on, it's, a, it's an acoustic guitar part in the beginning, but there is this hammer-on in the beginning that is super, super cool for you guitar players. It, and I'm sure you probably already know the track, but it's Bother. I, I love the early melodic phases of the song. And I think Corey Taylor, this is one of those ones you can tell he's really pouring his heart and soul into the song that he's singing. I really dig this one. Now, these number three and number two, they're actually two songs. However, on the album, they kind of blend together. So we're going to run them the same way. Because even though it's two different songs, I don't see it that way. I see it, it's kind of like listening to an old concept album. It goes right through the end of Gone Sovereign and to the beginning of Absolute Zero. Now you can listen to Absolute Zero or Gone Sovereign as single off, single serving songs. I like them together. And again, that's how that op- that album opens. If you're uh, if you're unfamiliar, and uh, I'll just kind of say it for what it is. 
Uh, my favorite Stone Sour album is The House of Golden Bones Part 1. And uh, that came out way back in 2012. And um, it opens with Gone Sovereign and then goes to Absolute Zero. So number three is Gone Sovereign and then two is Absolute Zero. And uh, Absolute Zero is one of my favorite songs of the Corey Taylor catalog. I love the, the guitar on Gone Sovereign. I absolutely do. I love the fact that from the very beginning, it's like, here we go. All right, here we go. But Absolute Zero, the lyrical content in this one just absolutely blows me away. And I think Corey Taylor, again, this is a guy that puts his heart and soul in everything. You can feel it. But number one, complete contrast to some of this rock and stuff we've talked about. Going back to the Come Whatever May album, a song that has been streamed on Spotify over 350 million times. Is that not remarkable? And that's just on Spotify. And most of the population is not on Spotify. Most of the streaming music uh, Americans are on Apple Music. So I can only begin to imagine, when you, if you factored in all the streams out there, this thing's probably close to a billion streams. It's ridiculous. It's a great track called Through Glass. You know, I'm looking at you through the glass. I don't know how much time has passed. All I know is it feels like forever. I'm not going to sing it for you, but you know the song. It is amazing to me how this song has been one of those things that people, even beyond the rock community, have kind of latched on to. It's like everybody knows this. I mean, it's like, just pick some random person on the street and ask them to see their playlist. They probably have Through Glass from Stone Sour on their playlist. And I, and I can't really un describe why that is. It is a remarkable song. And it would be irresponsible not to have it number one. But again, Stone Sour is kind of the, uh, the PG-13 version of the Corey Taylor experience. You know, I got, some, I got a friend of mine that has uh, a tattoo of every mask that Corey Taylor has worn with Slipknot. I mean, so he is out there. I mean, Corey is a dude that uses Slipknot and Stone Sour and does a lot of uh, solo stuff. And this guy's a creative genius. And I, I was reluctant to accept that for a long time. And I finally was like, you know what, maybe I'm wrong here. Because I didn't like how obnoxious Slipknot kind of hit the scene. But it's like, oh, these guys are great. And I'm like, no, they're really not. They're kind of just doing what everybody else did before. They're just, there's more theatrics here than substance to their music because they're just out here with these wild masks on and costumes. It's kind of like they're ripping off Kiss. It's like, we're going to go out here and do this. And uh, I didn't think the early stuff was very good. But they won me over. And uh, again, I'm a Corey Taylor fan. And um, I do like the Stone Sour stuff when I'm traveling a little bit more. But uh, there's some Slipknot stuff that sometimes when I just want to lay their hammer down and grip my teeth, I'll put on some Slipknot stuff and, and feel pretty cool about that too. So maybe we come back and do Slipknot on Friday. Maybe. I'm surprised we hadn't done these bands. I was just riding along of the day, listening to Stone Sour, and I'm like, Roy, have we done Stone Sour or Slipknot? No, we've done neither. I'm thinking, where have we been? What have we been doing? How did we have this low-hanging fruit that we did not partake of? So that's my top ten list. You may disagree, and you know what? When it comes to Stone Sour and Slipknot, I'm not going to give you the whole disclaimer about you're gonna, you have the right to be wrong, because you may be right. There's a lot of quality stuff in the Corey Taylor catalog. It is. Absolutely. And if you haven't listened to the solo album, we encourage you to do that too. It is, it is a little bit um, over the top at times, I guess you'd say. A little bit. A little bit. I mean, it's very Corey Taylor-ish. But that's your list today. If you have ideas for the top ten list, reach out let us know. The best way to do that is on social media. Uh, Roy is available on Twitter at Dogmatic67. That's D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. I'm on all forms of social media at Scout Steve R. And you can find our great list on Spotify. You can add to uh, Stone Sour's streams by checking us out on Spotify also at Dogmatic67. Be sure and check it out. Let us know. And send us your ideas. You never know. We may just do it. We did a Hank Cochran a couple days ago. I, and... and uh, our buddy hit us up, and I haven't had the, number, the time to check the numbers yet, but we will. I don't expect it's going to do great, because uh, we don't have a ton of country music fans here, and those that we do, 
are like they, they got like a Chevy lift kit and the KC lights and um, you know the the bedazzled jeans. I'm just kidding, uh, but yeah, we'll see. You know, we'll see. I'm just happy to do it, man, and, and to honor the music of uh, of a great Mississippian and a guy that's in the Country Music Hall of Fame. That's a pretty cool thing. So, so there you go. But again, uh, thanks as always for your support of the top 10 list. All right, next segment of the show is always brought to you by Campus Book Mart, a Stark Billion institution that's been serving the Mississippi State fan base for many, many years. A lot of people want to tell you they got the best selection of Mississippi State merch. They don't. Campus Book Mart does. Neatly positioned on the backside of campus, swing through next time you're in town. Go pick up your Mississippi State merch. Go ahead. Hey, Bulldog fans, have you considered maybe signing up for one of these milk kit delivery services? I bet you have, and you probably thought, you know what, I don't know if it'll work for me. Well, it will. Our friends at HelloFresh are the official partner of the Boneyard when it comes to milk kits. Here's the deal. You get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients, and seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. You can skip all those trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Here's the deal, too. It's so cool. HelloFresh Market has new snacks, meals, and more to add to your weekly order than ever, like their fun s'mores bundles for the kids. That'll be popular. You wanted something a little more technical, maybe off the beaten path? HelloFresh makes entertaining easy with a selection of crowd-pleasing eats like their bratwurst bar with caramelized onions, Dijonet slaw and pineapple relish, or even a snack board with pretzel bites. Spice bar nuts and even hot honey peach jam. Doesn't that sound appetizing? Go to HelloFresh.com slash Boneyard16, the number 16. That's HelloFresh.com slash Boneyard16. And you know what? You get 16 free meals plus free shipping. How cool is that? Going to make it easier than ever. So you have HelloFresh delivered right to your door. Change their own site. And then drive over with your brand new threads to one of Mississippi State's historic venues. If you can't make it to town, visit them on the World Wide Web, courtesy of Al Gore's Internet, at campusbookmart.net. Promo code BSR, exclusively for Boneyard listeners. That stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. BSR. That gets you free shipping on all orders over 75 bucks. Any order less than 75 bones, absolutely incomplete. Mom, I'm going to go ahead and tell you now. Dad may not have told you, but he wants some new gear. And he loves it when you buy it for him. Buy something for yourself, outfit the kids. You don't want to be on campus without having something cool and fresh to rep the brand of the maroon and white. Again, it's campusbookmart.net, promo code BSR. All right, we got a new commitment yesterday in baseball. Uh, Steven Spalletti out of Mandeville, Louisiana. At one time, he went to St. Paul's over in Covington, and then he was at Fountain Blue there in Mandeville. Originally a Texas A&M commitment, and then he changed his allegiance to Tulane. And uh, there were uh, obviously was some academic component to all of that. He elects to uh, get released from his letter of intent, and he is now going to be a Bulldog. And there's a lot of things that happened with this that works out really well for us. We had gotten unbalanced when it came to the catcher position. Last year, we signed three catchers. Two of them have transferred because Ross Highfield has won the job. We we think Ross Highfield is our catcher for the next two years. He won't be draft eligible until after the 2025, 2025 season. So we'll have him for two more years. And uh, so you, you got a little bit unbalanced there because you had, you know, three freshman catchers. And so you go out and get an older guy in Jackson Owen from Northeast Mississippi Community College. And that guy can play too. And you get Johnny Long to a transfer from uh, Pitt. So instead of having a glut right there at the sophomore class, and even though one of those guys would have redshirted, now you have a senior in Long, a junior in Owen, a sophomore in Highfield, and now a freshman in Spalletti. So that works out well for us. It gives us balance to the position. That's one of the most important things in college athletics is to have balance in the roster because you never know when guys are going to leave early. You never know when guys are going to transfer, and you don't want to be have, have a glut in one particular class. So we've addressed that issue. Uh, to kind of give you a little background on uh, Spalletti, he originally committed to Texas A&M. 
and is rated the number one catching prospect in the state of Louisiana. My attitude about Louisiana has always been this. I don't really want guys that LSU doesn't at least sniff. I have a lot of respect for LSU baseball, as you guys know. I hate losing to those guys, but you, you can't knock what they've done, seven national championships, no matter how they've done it. But Spalletti ranked the number six position player in the state of Louisiana, regardless of position. That includes pitchers. Ranked as the 43rd catcher in the country. And uh, we needed a late get. He initially signed with Tulane, as I mentioned, and uh, got out of the LOI, now headed to Mississippi State. So this is a very good late get. You know, we, we wondered about that. Would we take two catchers late? And we have. And so our needs are met in that respect. Does Spalletti become a dude for us? I don't know. Don't know. Uh, but I know that he is a guy that um, was highly recruited, rated by perfect game as a 9.5 on a 10-point scale, 5'11", 190-ish pounds, played uh, his senior year at third base. So he, he's like, hey, I'm not just a catcher, right? Uh, we talked about that extensively yesterday. You can read that article for free over at jeanspage.com if you haven't done so already. But, uh, yeah, this is a guy that's, you know, been to the uh, national showcases and things like that. He is well-traveled and well-known as a prospect. Ran a 6-6-3 in a 60-yard dash, which is pretty good. And uh, a guy, obviously, that, um, you know, is a developmental guy. You know, he is – his catcher pop time is 1.84. That's a little bit – a little bit slow. But not bad. Not bad by any stretch of the imagination. Not anything that college coaching – uh, you know, can't address, but uh, your good commitment, and he will be on campus uh, August the 11th. That's when the junior college and portal guys and the late signees will report is August the 11th. So uh, while many of your high school players are already here working through workouts, he'll be here as soon as he can. He'll have a little bit of summer, and then he'll come be, uh, be a part of all this. And so now with that need met, and that wasn't as emergent as us finding a backup catcher. And I believe, I believe we're good at catcher. And you can give uh, Spalletti a little time to develop. Uh, but all that said, there's a lot to work through with this portal. As I mentioned, three pressing issues this summer. We have received glowing reviews from the first two. Now it's about portal. Now, we've talked extensively on this show about what we need to get. You know, a lot of people are like, Steve, we need to retool the whole roster. Well, no, we don't. And when you start looking ahead here and start thinking, okay, what, what's a lineup look like? Well, I think if we played a, a baseball game today based on what we have, I'd have Bryce Jansen left, Hyzak in center, and then Dakota Jordan goes over to right, which is his more natural position with his arm. And you know, the longest throw you're going to make, obviously, is from right to third. He can make that with regularity. Third base is something that's up for competition. You go out and you get Logan Kohler from Memphis, and so you feel like he's a plug-and-play guy. Dylan Cup, a guy that's got first-round talent, doesn't have a first-round bat, but he doesn't lag behind as much as some people have suggested. That's probably one of those things that, you know, he needs to kind of fine-tune a bit as we get into uh, the college. But defensively, he is a major leaguer. He is defensively exactly what you would want in a high school prospect. I, I, to be honest with you, I talked to a scout, I don't know, three months ago, and I said, tell me about Dylan Cobb, because he was starting to get in some of these uh, mock drafts as a guy that was a top 200 type player. And they said, do you like Jacob Gonzalez? I know he's an old Miss guy, but do you like Jacob Gonzalez? And I said, I, I, listen, yeah, I respect Jacob Gonzalez. Guy's a great shortstop. He said, he is Jacob Gonzalez. Said the bat lags a little bit behind where Gonzalez was as a freshman and high school senior, but not that far behind. But defensively, he is a guy that can make all the plays. He is a guy that anything deep in the hole at short, he can make the play. He has a big-time arm. And with the needs that we've had at shortstop uh, the last year and a half, we need a guy that can be a defensive stopper. Now, is Cup a day one starter? Well, that kind of remains to be seen. We'll see what happens in the fall. Of course, he's here now kind of working through everything, but he is going to play as a freshman. How much he plays kind of remains to be seen. Well, then you've got Amani Larry, 
that we'll get some free agent tenders. We do expect him to be back. And then there's David Marchand. So you've got four guys for three spots. Now, somebody can DH. That might be Larry. It may be Kohler. I don't know. But the reality of it is, is now you have some depth on the infield. Of course, you can't forget Nate Chester, who's kind of a utility guy. Uh, can get in and make some plays for you, too. You know, the bat's maybe not quite where you want it to be. But the depth concerns we had in the middle infield are somewhat abated because of the fact Larry didn't get drafted. Then at first base, you know, Hunter Hines will be your first baseman. And, of course, you know, we're going to be hypercritical of everybody at this point of the year. It's like, hey, got to find the right guys. But uh, Hunter Hines, a guy that's got a chance to uh, lead the Cape Cod League, which is the most prestigious of the summer leagues. It's a wooden bat league, too. And uh, I got it just hidden tank after tank after tank out there. So you feel like, hey, you know, hey, if we can get the Hunter Hines we've had the last two years, we're going to be in good shape. But I suspect you're going to get an even more polished Hunter Hines. You know, he, he was learning to play first base, did a decent job last year, made some mistakes at times. He got to learn to stretch a little bit better. But the reality of it is, is offensively, you feel like this could be a very offensive lineup. And then, of course, you add Ross Highfield behind the plate. You start running the numbers here, and you start thinking, okay, who are the double-digit home run guys? Logan Kohler could be. He was a guy that uh, you know, was a big bat, led uh, Memphis with no protection. In just about every offensive category, he was at least one or two. In just about every offensive category, should be a double-digit home run guy. Could Amani Larry be a double-digit home run guy? He got close this year. You know, but that, that's a guy when SEC play got here, it was a little bit dicey at times. You know Hunter Hines is a double-digit home run guy. You feel like Ross Highfield could be. He nearly was last year. Dakota Jordan certainly will be. Connor Isaac could be. That's a guy that didn't get a lot of ABs last year. And so, you know, how does that all fit? Bryce Chance, not a double-digit home run guy, but he's a guy that he hits for average and he's got a little bit of clutch in him. Well, then you factor in, we talk about portal traffic. You know, really we're prioritizing arms, but Braden Montgomery from Stanford, originally from uh, Germantown High School, then went to Madison Central, and was high school teammates with Ross Highfield and Hunter Hines. That gives you a lot of advantages. It does. I've been told if it boils down to NIL, State won't be outbid. Now, I've heard some gaudy numbers out there associated with Braden Montgomery, and a lot of people, you just wince when you hear that, but that's the reality of the life in which we're living. you got to have some NIL opportunities not for these guys. That's just kind of the reality of, of how things are. Until they get a handle on this, you know, we got to tread water. But Braden Montgomery is a difference maker. And I think that he's a guy, you take him, I think he's your center fielder. And he's also a guy that wants to pitch a little bit. I was told he didn't get to pitch as much as he wanted to at Stanford, so he wants to pitch wherever he goes. Uh, I've heard a lot of schools in connection with him, and, of course, it's still early in the process. But uh, you know, LSU obviously will be involved. Uh, I'm told Tennessee not so much. Vanderbilt's been involved. Um, and, of course, Mississippi State. Now, he has a no-contact listing in the portal. And a lot of people don't know what, quite what that means. As a do-not-contact means he doesn't want to field calls from 600 teams. Many of the elite players and just about every player that has uh, Major League Baseball aspirations has an agent or representative, representative. And so usually what happens when guys say do-not-contact, guys like Greg Montgomery will go to their rep and say, hey, these are the schools that I'm interested in talking to. And then that person reaches out to those schools to see about setting up visits and calls and things like that. And so that's really the purpose behind that. You know, Paul Skeens last year was in the portal and had a no contact order, and that didn't stop anybody from contacting him. But you want to do things the way a player wants them done, but there's no guarantee you're going to get the call. But I can assure you Mississippi State has gotten a call. Uh, on behalf of Braden Montgomery. Braden Montgomery's people, for the better part of a year, have said, you know what, he's considering transfer. This time last year, we were told that he was going to transfer. And uh, didn't come to fruition last year. But, of course, they go out there and go to Omaha this year. And some have suggested there's always a possibility that he could return to Stanford. I'm, I'm told that is a very remote possibility, that he is looking to get closer to home. Uh, Texas A&M is another school. A lot of connections to Braden with A&M. And people are like, well, I don't understand. There was all this talk about a girlfriend. And um, listen, when I was serious about uh, the woman that became my wife, I would, you know, I would have moved to Alaska to be with her. Forget the rest of it, right? 
I also wasn't a Major League Baseball prospect that could potentially be a first-rounder. And so I feel like that's not going to be the issue that, that some may suggest because of the fact that, uh, you know, a year from now, Braden Montgomery is going to be a millionaire. You know, and so I think any true relationship could probably endure that, right? We'll just stick it out for a year. We'll FaceTime as much as we can, get together when we can, and then, uh, you know, this time next year I'll be a millionaire. Uh, some people have suggested Vanderbilt would be a good landing spot for him because they recruited him exceptionally hard uh, out of high school. I think they ultimately finished second or third in his recruitment, but I, I'm told that they're in it but may not be – the factor that a lot of people suggest. A&M has probably been a bit of a dark horse in this thing. And when I first heard about it, I was like, A&M, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, then I you know, put it out there on the board, and I've got people contacting me. He's like, yes, he has some connections there. I understand there's like a hitting coach that he's very close to. And uh, there's a recruiting coordinator, uh, Noah Kane at A&M, that used to be at LSU. And when LSU was courting Montgomery, he was very involved. So he has some relationships with A&M. Will that be enough to overcome the fact that Hunter Hines, Dakota Jordan, and Ross Highfield are here? Uh, Ross Highfield and Dakota Jordan are actually living together right now. You know, so uh, I think Braden Montgomery, when he looks at this, he'll say, you know, there is a line up here to protect me so I can put up some big numbers. That's one of the reasons that I'm told that Ole Miss has not really been a serious consideration. That's not to say they won't be. That's not to say they won't work their way into contention. I, I don't expect that to be the case. But when you look at this Ole Miss uh, lineup, you know, the draft wasn't bad to them, but they lost some of their key components. And so that's a team next year that's probably going to be picked, you know, last uh, in the West. I would I would suggest that's probably the case. Now, pitching-wise, they ought to be okay. But offensively, there's not a lot of pieces to work around Braden Montgomery to protect him. So we'll see. A lot of people are trying to say, hey, it's a done deal. He's going to Mississippi State. I don't believe that. That's not to say that I don't think State's going to ultimately get him. I think right now State is the leader. But I also think that uh, there's a lot of recruiting left to go here in the next couple of weeks. And so I like where State sits at Braden Montgomery. And, uh, and one of the main reasons that I do is sourcing, right? It's like when you talk to sources, it's not just to hear people talk. You want what they say to happen. And so I've been told now for the better part of two months that Braden Montgomery was going to go in the portal. I was told last week there was a good chance he would do it after Team USA Baseball was done and go in on a final day, uh, which was uh, is tomorrow. So he actually beats that by a couple of days. But he is, in fact, in the NCAA transfer portal, as our sources suggested he would be, for several weeks. And so that lends me to think that maybe perhaps we're talking to the right people. And those people tell me Mississippi State is very much a factor in Braden Montgomery. Now, I think State's going to be a really good team next year anyway. We're going to be at least be a good team. You get Braden Montgomery in a lineup with what you've got coming back offensively, and all of a sudden I think you realize this is a team that's capable of some pretty special things, provided the pitching holds up. And that's the, really the million-dollar question, right, is how good can this pitching staff be with a change of the guard between Foxhall and Justin Parker? Well, as I've said on this show before, whoever the pitching coach is is going to get the benefit of having uh, a, a room full of guys that now have some SEC experience. Whereas last year you had, again, 13 of 17 pitchers were first-year Bulldogs. And you're going to have some first-year Bulldogs this year they are going to have to pitch too. However – uh, the guys that are returning will make a jump. If you've seen Evan Sierra's summer league numbers, it's, it's remarkable how well he's pitched. And uh, that's the thing that I look at guys like Brock Tapper, and I look at Logan Forsythe, and I look at Evan Sierra. Listen, they weren't scared to get in there and pitch. You know, and occasionally they got rocked. But they weren't scared to get in there and compete. And that's one of the things that I think that this pitching staff has lacked the last two years is guys with a willingness to compete. Guys that are willing to get in there and compete and, if necessary, get hit. But when you've got guys walking the ballpark, uh, that's not necessarily about the pitching coach. That's not necessarily about the head coach. That's about the pitcher himself. And we can talk about pitch selection and we can talk about lack of execution, but the reality of it is this. Are you man enough to play in the SEC or not? No matter who the coach is, no matter what your NIL deal was, no matter how many stars are next to your name or what perfect game calls you, 
Are you willing to get in there and trust your stuff and pound the zone? I don't need a coach to tell me that because I'm a natural competitor, and perhaps you are too. I don't need a coach to tell me I need to throw strikes. I don't need a coach to tell me, hey, you need to cut down on the walks. I know enough about baseball to understand what my job is as a pitcher. I'm not up there to throw BP, but i got to go up there and throw strikes. And you can say whatever you want to. You know, maybe it's missed evaluations or whatever, but I think the bigger part of evaluations is finding kids that are a history of strike throwing and guys that have the mental fortitude to get in there and compete. And that's what makes this next part of the show the most intriguing. Uh, Mason Molina from Texas A&M. Are you familiar with him? Texas Tech, excuse me. Are you familiar with him? You know, this is a guy that State's been on. A lot of people thought as soon as he went in the portal, he was headed to Arkansas. Again, I'm told that's not the case. He may ultimately end up at Arkansas, but it hasn't been a situation where the deal is already done. And we're going to watch it really close. Mason Molina, big-time 2021 prospect, really big physical 6'2", 200-pounder, left-hander out of Rancho Santa Margarita, California. Ends up at Texas Tech, rated the number two left-handed pitcher in the state of California out of high school. And he has lived up to, um, to expectations. So he, the two years at Texas Tech, he, um, in 2022 as a freshman, he goes two and five. But he started nine games as a freshman, and you know, some of those were midweek, some of those were conference games. But 71 strikeouts to 29 walks and allowed four home runs and 57 innings pitched. And so strikeouts per nine inning for him were 11.1. That's ridiculous. And, again, you know, you look at the two and five, and you look at it and say, well, Steve, he wasn't that great. But then you get a little deeper in numbers, and you realize this is a guy that's a strike thrower. Last year, he goes six and two, starts 16 games for him. ERA goes down to 3.67. Of course, the wins go up. Of course, it's his second year. We talk about it with the Bulldogs. You know, people make the jump once they get a year of Power 5 baseball experience under their belt. But 83 innings pitch for them. And then the strikeouts per nine inning actually go up again, 11.7. And he is a guy that's willing to challenge you. Allowed 10 home runs last year and 83 innings pitch. So, you know, he's going to give up, you know, a home run in nearly every outing. But uh, that's just kind of part of the deal. Home runs per nine innings, 1.1. So, uh, but he is a guy, too. Again, 108 Ks against 35 walks. Uh, that's, you know, again, right at three to one. You can kind of live with that. And five hit by pitches. But, uh, you know, a guy, again, really just beginning to kind of find himself, but made a nice jump from year one to year two. And, again, he may end up at Arkansas. But I think when you look at Arkansas and what they have coming back, I mean, Hagan Smith is back. I mean, Brady Tiger is back. You know, what do they do with Brady? Does Brady go to the weekend? Uh, is he a starter? You know, we'll see. But uh, this that's a dude that we're on. And uh, I understand that he has uh, been in regular contact with the staff. And uh, I believe he's already taken an official visit here and got some more trips to take. And we'll see how things go. But, um, you know, we're on him. We're on him. And we're chasing some of the big, biggest names in college baseball. Uh, Chase Burns out of Tennessee, you know, we faced him. You remember Hunter Hines hit an absolute monster of a home run against him. I even tweeted it before it happened. I said, hey, with a fireballer like this and a fastball hitter like Hines, you might see something special happen here. And sure enough, we did. We ultimately lost that ball game. Uh, which we shouldn't, but um, we let it get away from us. But he is originally from Gallatin, Tennessee. A guy that's done some pretty special stuff. You know, he was a freshman All-American and uh, wants to start. And that's one of the things that uh, – one of the reasons he's leaving Tennessee is while he has been very good in long relief, he lost his starting position. And Tennessee obviously has some guys they could move around. But Chase Burns is phenomenal. 4.25 ERA, which that's got to get a little bit better, but uh, you could live with that. But 5-3 and three record. He started eight games and had 10 relief appearances. Had a couple of saves. Had 72 innings pitch, which is second most on the team to first round. Excuse me, third most on the team to Chase Dollinger. 
So uh, Burns, less than a hit per inning, 114 Ks, which led the Volunteers, and 22 walks. Gave up 10 home runs, one of those to Hunter Hines. Batting average against, 222. We're, we're, we're competing with LSU here, right? And there's a handful of other schools, but it looks to be a state LSU thing. Now, with us and LSU going head-to-head on so many, LSU's going to get some. The main thing we have to do, we have to get an ace. We have to get an ace. And if you can get another weekend pitcher, that's just certainly a bonus. I mean, you begin to think about the possibilities. And, again, I, don't, I call them possibilities, not probabilities. But let's, what if you could get Luke Holman and Mason Molina or Chase Burns and Mason Molina or Luke Holman? But, again, you're going head-to-head with LSU and most of these kids, and they're going to get one of those guys for sure. We're not going to get them all. It's important to understand that. And when it does happen, the sky is not falling. I mean, LSU is a defending NFL champion and uh, a program, obviously, that uh, is not afraid to write a check out of their NIL foundation uh, to secure the, the services of a player. So that's important to understand. But Burns, another guy we expect to visit uh, here in the next uh, you know, week or so. And then Luke Holman also expected to visit the next week or two. And Luke Holman, you know, we didn't see him this year. He had some tightness at times this year, but uh, – 81 innings pitched, 7-4 and four record. Look at the strikeout numbers, 87. So it's a strikeout per, and again, about half of this, or more than half of it's an SEC competition. He had 12 against Sanford, which is a season high, and just five innings of work. Think about that, 15 recorded outs, 12 of them, by the way, of strikeout. Uh, that'll get it done. In SEC play, he was a little more of a pitch-to-contact guy. He never had more than four strikeouts, and that was against Ole Miss. That was his season high in SEC play in a win where he goes six and two-thirds of an inning. But uh, he is a guy that rarely went above 100 pitches, just three times on the year. Went 103 against Ole Miss, 101 against Florida, 104 against Wake Forest. And uh, it took the loss, obviously, in the, uh, in the NCAA Super Regional. But this is a dude that could help us too. And so, again, when you begin to think about Molina, Burns, Holman, some of the best pitchers in the portal right now, arguably the best pitchers in the portal right now, you got to at least get one. You have to get one. You start thinking, Steve, I, I want a whole week in rotation. Well, that's just not reasonable. But we've got to get one. you got to get one. That enables you to push everybody back a day. Of course, you know, you lose Cade Smith, right? So you're basically replace, replacing Cade Smith, and you kind of got to figure the rest of the weekend out. And that's the thing you begin to think about. You know, where's Bradley Lofton, right? Where does he fit in? Where does Gerangelo? Hey, if Bradley's 100% healthy and you get Gerangelo's confidence back, well, that's your Saturday and Sunday guy right there. And so, again, at a bare minimum, you got to get one of these guys. You get two makes you feel a whole lot better about life. Of course, you got Nate Lamb coming up from Division Two, and while his summer numbers have been outstanding, you know, it's a big jump from any level to the SEC. But if Nate Lamb, if all he does is eat up innings for us in the midweek and then does some situational pitching as a lefty on the weekends, then that's worth his scholarship money. You know, we're not, we're not expecting Nate Lamb to come in here and be our Friday night guy. And I'll do respect to Nate. That's just not the expectation. I mean, he may come in here and surprise us. Remember Zach Naff, how bad his numbers were when he transferred in? People were like, holy smokes. But you know what? We don't get to Omaha without Zach Naff because down the stretch, I know that super regional at Vanderbilt, Zach Naff was absolute money. Absolute money in that thing. And so there can be some guys with pieces. And I go back and think about Jared Liebelt. Do you guys remember how good Jared Liebelt was for us in 19? You remember that? Do you remember? I mean, I mean honestly, let's go back and look at this. The jump that Jared Liebelt made from year one to year two at Mississippi State is absolutely ridiculous, man. Absolutely ridiculous. I'm going to pull these numbers up here if, the, if uh, Al Gore can get the internet kick-started for me. But, um, you know, he came in and people were like, okay, well, what we got here? But, uh, you know, in, in 19, my goodness, we wanted him to pitch all the time. You know, that breaking stuff he had was just absolutely filthy. Those are the things that I go back and I think about is like, you know, this is a guy, too, that was really after his first year at Mississippi State was kind of on the scrap heap of our pitching staff. And was like, ah, you know, I just don't know about this guy. 
at least in the, uh, in the eyes of our fans, that's kind of how it looked. Well, let's go back here and look at 2018. And you remember what a, you know, what a crazy year that proved to be. 2018, you know, we got off to such a bad start. We turned it around and uh, swept Arkansas and took a series from Ole Miss. Next thing you know, we sweep Florida, number one Florida. But, uh, you know, Jared Liebelt was just, in that year, was just kind of an also-ran. Guys, Jared Liebelt, in 2018, had an ERA of 13.15 in 12 appearances. He had one start for us that year, right? And he only went 13 innings in 12 appearances, right? Allowed 21 hits. 21 runs, 19 of them earned, eight walks, seven strikeouts, six doubles. Batting average against was a team worst, 362. You remember that? You probably had forgotten. You're probably like, oh, well, Steve, I don't know. Was he really that bad? Yes, he was that bad. That's like I think about some of the comments that we see about some of the returning pitchers this year. It's incredible how things changed. Jared Liebelt in 2019, 2.96 ERA, yeah, down from 13, <laughs> 34 appearances, 2-0 and record, 5 saves, 54 innings pitched, right at a hit per inning, 26 runs, only 18 of them earned, 11 walks against 38K, so we're 3-1 right there, 12 doubles, uh, a triple and four dingers, and then batting average against down to 269. But, guys, do you know how many clutch appearances Jared Liebelt had for us in the postseason? I mean, down the stretch, that's the guy you, you guys wanted to pitch. Every time a, a tough situation came up, it's like, let's get Liebelt in, and we can get it to Colby White. Let's find a way to get Liebelt in. And so I, I share that with you because to kind of understand there is a developmental piece and a maturation process that has to take place. And you know what's interesting, too? Do you remember who the pitching coach was in 2018? That was Gary Henderson. You know who the pitching coach was in 2019? Scott Foxhall. And so I, I don't say that to praise Scott. I'm just trying to illustrate the fact that a first-year pitching coach can come in and maybe take a guy that we've given up on and make him a very reliable contributor. And uh, I'm very proud of Jared Lee Belt. Jared ends up getting drafted. Uh, Jared's dad it is an incredible guy. I mean, you know, it's like I think about this guy shows up and, and really struggles, and he could have quit. He could have just said, you know what, the, the SEC is just too tough for me. But instead, he hangs in here and he gets better. And so, again, that's just one example. I can give you several more, but that's just one example of a guy that many of our fans just thought would never make a meaningful contribution here ends up being a guy that becomes one of our more reliable relievers the next year. And some of it maybe had to do with how we used it, but also it had to do with just the natural maturation of acclimating to play in a Southeastern Conference. You learn how people are attacking you. You learn how to break down hitters. You learn how to evaluate film. They never had to do that in junior college. You kidding me? I mean, come on. And so I share that with you because I think it's important to understand that there are some pieces on this team that are going to be better. Now, we can't just rely on that and say, you know what, everybody's going to be better, so we're going to be better. No, we can't do that. we got to hit the portal, and we got to bring in an influx of talent there. And Again, we got a ton of pitchers coming in from the high school ranks, but, you know, Having a trap freshman out there is tough. I mean, there's only one Paul Mahalam every generation, it seems, right? And I think Bradley Lofton's a guy that's going to be a big leaguer someday, too. And you didn't get to see the full, you know, the full palette last year because he was banged up. Yeah, and, guys, in order for us to, to have a great regular season and get to Hoover and beyond, we're going to have to cover you know, well over 500 innings. Could be as many as 600 if you get to Omaha. And one pitcher from the portal is not going to be able to do that. You're not going to be able to have a guy. You listen, Paul Skeens, look at the, the impact he had at LSU. I mean, and, and Paul's a freak. I mean, let's, let's just call it for what it is. Wes Johnson did a good job with him, but, you know, Paul is a once-in-a-generation type pitcher. 
he he was a proven commodity when he went to LSU and he got better at LSU. He did. Now, of course, the guy that made him better is gone, gone to Georgia and West Johnson. But having the reliability of having a Friday night guy that's going to get you a win more times than not, and in Paul Skeen's case, every time but one, it changes the complexion of your team. If LSU didn't get Paul Skeen's last year, they're still a regional team. But are they in Omaha? I would venture to say no. That's, a, that's how much a difference the guy makes. You say, well, they got Tommy White. They did. They did. And he's going to be back next year launching beach balls over the fence with regularity. The guy's a stud. But the most impactful transfer in all of college baseball was Paul Skeens. He took LSU from being a team that, hey, probably be a host team to winning a national championship. And they didn't even pitch in a championship game. And so give them some credit for figuring that thing out. But I share that because I think it's important to understand. Even we Listen, we would love to win an AFL championship, and there's no Paul Skeens out there. But how much better would life be to have a bona fide Friday night ace? A guy that's already done it before. And then you can kind of push people back. And so when you look at that LSU pitching staff prior to – the transfer portal, right? So Thatcher Hurd was a guy that was just kind of mediocre much of the year and really found it in postseason. And the kid was electric in Omaha. And, and maybe that has something to do with playing in a bigger ballpark. Maybe he just had more confidence to challenge hitters, and he's probably their Friday night guy this year. But you factor in all of that. Riley Cooper, another guy transferred in from you know, Arizona. You know, LSU kind of rebuilt their pitching staff in the portal, but it wasn't just those guys. Look at the Gidry kid, a kid that wasn't even going to play this year. Ends up playing a big role for them in Omaha. Yeah, he did give up a big tank, you know, one night. But it's not just the portal. And that's important to understand. It's not just about us. It's really college baseball now. But I venture to say that you're not going to find a Paul Skeens. You're not going to find, uh, you know, Waldrop. You're not going to find a, you know, you might find a Thatcher Hurd, right? And that was a guy that was a little bit banged up. He had the back injury at UCLA, and people were like, you know what, I don't know if he's going to be ever make it. And, uh, listen, he wasn't great much of the year, but he found it late. And so that's kind of what we are too. If you can find that bona fide ace, everything else tends to kind of fall in place because you look at what you've got back. Nate is back. And I'm so excited to see what Justin Parker is going to do with Nate Dome. Because Nate's a competitor. Nate's a guy that doesn't care. Nate's like, you know what? If you hit it, you hit it. But I'm coming to get you. And more times than not, Nate wins. And then, of course, after the Auburn game, you know, he wasn't quite himself. You got Aaron Nixon back, you know, unless something crazy happens. But Aaron Nixon will be back. And so you start thinking about last year, we had all these questions about the back end. Well, looking to this year, we really don't have those questions about the back end. It's, you know, starting pitching, you know. And that's the thing you think about with Gerangelo. Gerangelo makes a jump, Lofton makes a jump, and you go get a bona fide Friday night ace, all of a sudden you got something. You talk about the lineup, you talk about the pitching, you know, there's a lot of innings you got to cover, you know. And how many times have we had good starting pitching – which has been a kind of regular, a, a rarity in the last two years, but you've had a good start and the bullpen couldn't hold it. Well, that's happened a lot. But now all of a sudden you begin to see this bullpen kind of coming together, and I think it's worthy of getting excited about. But we need at least one bona fide SEC starter on the weekend and probably take a couple more. I think when it's all said and done, we'll probably take probably three more arms. Now, there's also this factor to consider, too. There's a lot of discussion that Chase Burns and Braden Montgomery want to play together. That's interesting. Well, we would certainly provide him that opportunity. And you, you feel like LSU would likely provide him that opportunity. I mean, LSU, well, what's Braden Bear going to do? I love Braden Bear. I, I think that, that at LSU, I think Braden Bear is kind of an unheralded hero on that team. Uh, Bear got drafted. Is it going to be high enough for him to go? Will LSU spend, exhaust some of their NIL money to keep – they had a lot of guys drafted yesterday in day three. And so that's the thing you begin – does it get to be a bidding war where it kind of depletes the war chest a little bit or is, you know, Marucci ready to write another check? You know, I don't know. It's an interesting dynamic. We're all kind of learning together. 
But if Chase Burns and Braden Montgomery really want to play together, and let's say, you know, State's able to get both of those guys. Let's say you don't get anybody else. Let's just say you get Burns and Montgomery. And then maybe you go get a G5 pitcher here or there that can kind of give you some confidence on the weekend to have a little more depth. I would have to say you'd look, hey, we've met our needs, but I'm greedy. I really want to get two of these guys. I'm, I'm tired of not going to Omaha. I'm tired of not going to Hoover. I'm tired of not hosting regionals, right? I, I don't want to just be a good team. I want to be a great team. And I do think Bradley Lofton and Drangelo are the future. But we need a guy this year to kind of move them back a day to give us the opportunity to have a reasonable expectation to win on Fridays. And then all of a sudden you start getting deeper into this thing and you think about natural talent with Lawson and Drangelo. You got to think. You got a chance to win more weekends than not. Because I think offensively we're going to be a good team. I think we're going to be a really good team. You add Braden Montgomery in the mix, you got a chance to be an elite team. So it's a different day and time. And uh, so that's kind of the focus now for your Bulldog baseball staff is uh, hosting some guys and finishing this thing up on, in the portal. And, again, you're chasing some of the biggest names in college baseball. And we got to get them. And we talk about – again, I told you guys we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about NIL. I read this stuff all the time. And people say, well, can we put some NIL money in there? Well, where do you think that comes from? Do you think the university writes a check? You think Chris Simonis is the guy putting his own money up? No. You know, that all comes from your own contributions to NIL. And I understand we had a big-time uh, football fundraiser down in central Mississippi last night. Um, and so it's not like there's just unlimited amount of resources. Well, Steve, let's just make them an NIL deal. Where do you – again, it's not like the river. You know, at some point the well runs dry. And so that's where everybody has to be involved, if you can be. And if you can't be, look, I get it. And there are some people that can be that won't be, and that's, that's another story entirely. I'm not going to spend time talking about this. But I just want to frame this up. This is when your NIL dollars matter. But everybody acts like, well, you know, we'll, we'll just write them an NIL check. Well, it's easy to spend other people's money, isn't it? It's funny how that works. So I just share that because when we get into situations like this, and you look at what LSU has done, you know, again, no matter how you feel about it, it's kind of like the Vanderbilt thing. LSU work within the framework of the rules regarding NIL and put together a team that won the NAFL championship and had a great portal class. And, uh, again, you know, everybody was all excited about them getting Carter Young, and he ultimately signed – for big money, got drafted, wish him the best, but, man, that kid's got a hole in a swing bigger than the side of the house. Christian Little got drafted yesterday. Um, you know, he, he's a guy that pitched against us in game two in the NAFL Championship Series in 2021. He ends up being a mop-up guy at LSU. And people are like, oh, look at this portal class. Yeah, the portal class, depth-wise, was not what people expected it to be. But when you look at what LSU had, how they used – NIL to kind of fill their needs, it's tremendous. And so we have to kind of follow that same example because they're not going to slow down. They're going to continue. They're, listen, they hadn't been LSU for a long time. They were ready to get back to being LSU. And now they're back to being LSU. And that's got nothing to do with Jay Johnson. I mean, people are like, well, you know, Jay, guys, all he did was fill out the lineup card, <laughs> right? And I, well, he hired Wes Johnson, give him credit for that. But my point being is that, you know, it doesn't matter when I have the best roster. It, it doesn't matter if you're the better coach. You know, if I get to go pick out the best players and you got to play with leftovers, I'm going to win nine times out of ten. And so in order for us to get to where we need to be, we're going to have to do what we got to do to get the most talented roster on the field. And so in these coming days, that's going to be a big part of all of this. What do we need to do to get Braden Montgomery here? We can't just rely on the fact, well, well there's Hunter Hines and, and there's uh, Ross Heifel. They'd love to play together. Well, they haven't played together the last two years. It's not like that life ended for Braden Montgomery because he couldn't play with his friends. Does that help? Yes. Is it a deciding factor? No. 
Is NIL going to be the deciding factor? No. But to ignore its, its relevance would be short-sighted. NIL is going to be a factor. Relationships are going to be a factor. Being closer to home is supposed to be a factor. But whatever it takes, we got to do it. And we got to find a way to get at least one of these big arms, period. Anything else is just kind of throwing caution to the wind. We have got to be able to use our resources and our tradition and our pitching lab and our facilities and our incredible fan base and go get a couple of significant pieces out of this portal that make us a team that people can be scared of again. Because right now, nobody's scared of us. They're not. And I don't, I'm not comfortable in that role. Maybe you are. I, I'm just not comfortable uh, being the hunter, the hunter rather than the hunted. I want people to pack out stadiums when we show up because it's a big deal to play Mississippi State again. That's an important aspect of every bit of this. In order for us to get back to where we need to be, we've got to do some of the same things LSU did. And we've got to be better stewards with our money. We don't have as much. But the reality of it is, is we have to do what we have to do right now to get this thing going the way it needs to go. And, and listen, there's no shortage of needs. Chris Jans needs NIL money. Sam Purcell needs NIL money. Zach Arnett certainly does. It's, it's crazy to think how a baseball recruiting's become too. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that aren't in any way whatsoever concerned about NIL. But when you're out here in the deep water and you're swimming with the sharks, you got to live like sharks do. All right, that's going to do it for today. If you haven't done so, go to jeanspage.com and come join our merry maroon and white band of misfits. Uh, another record, another all-time high, and uh, we'll surpass that. Obviously, this this you typically after signing day, you see the little runoff. You know, people are like monthly or whatever, quarterly. They just want to get through signing day. And then uh, we didn't have that this year. We didn't have the big runoff. And, uh, you know, of course, I think there was a lot of you know, concern about baseball. We didn't have a big runoff there, and we built in the summer. And, uh, you know, again, we're in a great position. And uh, football is usually when we climb. So we're excited about that. Come be a part of the most extensive coverage of Mississippi State sports of all time. And I would submit to you nobody covered the Major League Baseball draft in the Southeastern Conference more extensively than Robbie Falk and I did. I, w- I, w- I will put us up against anybody. Period. Absolutely. Without question. And so our, our fans and our subscribers knew first and uh, kind of knew in advance of when things were going to happen as they happened. And that's something we take a lot of pride in. That's going to do it for today. We'll see you on Friday. But until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live.